Now, Goethe wrote about evolution a little bit different than Darwin, because what Goethe's concept was based on was the Greek concept of evolution, which said evolution is not accidental, but Aristotle said that evolution was due to a spirit within all created things that reflected the great primal mind, the mind of God. And every created thing knew where it was going knew its destiny. And it, the spirit of it he called the soul. This is where the soul, the word soul comes from. The Greeks trying to understand what causes things to evolve, you see. Mm -hmm. Now, what Goethe said, nah, it's more complicated than that. It's not just one thing that you can become through circumstances, there is a variety of possibilities, a montage of possibilities. But those possibilities are already embedded within the thing. So he connects the infinite variety of creation, which is what Darwin was trying to explain, to the concept of spirituality. But what is this flood? We now know there wasn't a universal flood. There may have been local floods, but there wasn't a universal flood. What was this flood? And what was this ship? What was the Ark of Noah? In the Quran, we get a clue where it says, the people who did not follow Noah, who were not on the ship, drowned in the sea of iniquity. <laughs> hey. <laughs> and the Ark of Noah, we'll learn, is that knowledge by which one obeys the laws and commandments and protects them from their lower nature. And the sea that the people drowned in when they failed to recognize Noah and these new laws brought by God was their own selfish desires. You see, they're symbols that every messenger of God protects the people from drowning in the sea of self. And every messenger of God builds an ark by which the people enter that ark and rescue, become rescued from their lower nature. You see, it's relativity, my friends. Drowning is only relative to that higher state of consciousness. If you're not conscious, you don't even know you're drowning. You, of course you go to the Pharaoh. Why? The Pharaoh becomes a follower of Moses, the whole country becomes a follower of Moses. Okay? The Pharaoh is the sign of God. He didn't come just to free the slaves. He comes to free all people from the slavery of their selfish desires, which is the too true slavery. You see, the messengers are not that concerned about worldly things. Christ said, leave unto Caesars what is Caesars. They're concerned about spiritual things. They're concerned about your eternal life. You only live here 70 years, but you have an eternal life and, and the afterlife in the heavenly realm. That's what they're preparing you for. You need to prepare yourself now that's why this life is important. But they're not concerned about the accidental occurrences of this world. Now we come to concept. I have given thee the samsara cycle, the cycle of rebirth. He said, 
that all people have Shraddha. And Arjuna says, what is Shraddha? He said, it's your viewpoint. It's the way you look at the world. He says, well, how do I know what a person's Shraddha is? He said, by what they do. See, there are people who say, well, I believe in this and I believe in that, but what do people really believe in? It's what they do. I believe this is really important, the most important thing in my life, after I go to the mall, and after I do this, and after I do that, then that's the most important thing in my life. Krishna says, Shraddha is what you truly believe in. It's how you see yourself in the world, and therefore, it's what creates your desires, and it's what you do. Okay, now listen carefully. <clears throat> so out of Shraddha comes your desires, your ambitions, your hopes. Because it's how you see yourself in the world. Okay? That leads to actions. And I'll, the Zoroaster will say actions are actually three things. Begin with thoughts, they go to words, and then to deeds. And from actions, there is a cause and effect relationship. In other words, you do something, there's a result. That's called karma. Karma, again, part of Hindu science is not just physical, it's also spiritual. There's karma in the physical world, that's an example of karma, and there's karma in the spiritual, same thing. You do something, causes something. If the Shraddha is aligned to truth, reality, it will lead to actions and karma that will give positive results. But if their Shraddha is not aligned to the truth, then it will lead to karma that will cause suffering. The purpose of suffering is to change your shraddha. <laughs> this is not rocket science, my friends. Right occupation. Now listen very carefully, my friends. Listen very carefully. This is a gem, 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 gem from Buddhism. If you learn nothing else from Buddhism, take this home with you. Buddha says, right occupation means you give more than you take. I would love to give that at that last board meeting of Enron. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Later we'll talk about Civilization, the whole concept of a civilization is based upon accumulating wealth. You do not have growth without wealth, and you do not have wealth without people creating more than they take. I guarantee you it would be a wonderful, wonderful study if someday someone would correlate the rise and fall of civilization at that point in which people began to take more than they gave. It's his greatest contribution called the universal principle. That which is good for all is good for me. What I hold good for myself, I should for all. Only law universal is true law. This will become the basis of the highest form of morality that would be developed by the philosopher Kant and others. And it will be a basis by which we can better understand the Baha'i writings, 
which even raises it to a new level of understanding of what universal law means and how to apply it, which will not only have an individual aspect, which is what all these messengers talked about, but a collective aspect. Socrates was the philosopher who said that speculation in philosophy was useless. That he warned the future generations from making philosophy talk about talk, which by the way is what we do in the universities today. He said the purpose of philosophy was nothing less than the total transformation of human character. And then he said, of course, this is the purpose of education. That if education does not transform character, then it, it is not true education. So he gave only one major sermon in which his teachings coalesce called the Sermon on the Mount. He said to his people, think not that I have come to destroy the law. Now why would he even say that? Well, because prior to the Sermon on the Mount, he was found healing and teaching people on the Jewish Sabbath. Of course, all of the spies of the, of the Sadducees were taking notes. They were building a case against him. And he said in response to their criticism of his working on the Sabbath, he says, think not that I have come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law and the prophets. I have come to fulfill the law by changing the laws. You see, this is when Excedrin became very popular. Because <laughs> this seems like a contradiction. In fact, you read the Bible. Contradictions everywhere. What are contradictions? Contradictions are when we confuse content and context. Hey, that's why I did that chart earlier on. Let's put that chart back up. Okay. There we go. I have come to fulfill the law. However, I change the laws. When the Jews and the Christians formed a union with the pagan tribes to destroy the early Islamic communities, caused great deal of suffering and hardship. Many of the followers went to Muhammad and said, why, Muhammad, must I learn about Jesus and Moses when their people are such enemies of, the, of our new faith? Why do I need to know about them? Why do I need to accept Jesus or Moses? And Muhammad made this famous statement, if you reject Moses or Jesus, you reject me. For we are one. My friends, if you do nothing else, get nothing else from this lecture series. Take from it the understanding that what these divine messengers brought and what the people today do in their name can be entirely different. The problem with
with the Renaissance was not that Europe received all these wonderful innovations. That's a wonderful thing. The problem is they didn't admonish the spiritual teachings along with these innovations. In other words, they took all the goodies, but they didn't take the spiritual principles to moderate their behaviors. You see, it's when you learn new knowledge, you also have a greater responsibility for that knowledge. We talked about this. When you receive new science, you have a greater responsibility for that science. There must be simultaneously with the new sciences, there must be new ethics and moralities that allow you to moderate the use of these new things. So you, if you want to understand the excesses of Europe over the past thousand years, you need to understand that the reason for many of those excesses is that they assimilated the technologies of Islam, but not the spiritual morality that went along with it. Baha'u'llah, one of the primary followers of the Bab, was put in with other followers into a dark dungeon at the bottom of Tehran. And in this filth that they had to live and, and sleep and eat, Baha'u'llah receives his revelation that he is the promised one that the Bab had foretold. Because in the Bob's writings, he said, though he brings an independent revelation, it is to prepare the people for the revelation to come after him. To understand the Bob and Baha'u'llah, you could say correctly, the Bob brings unity, Baha'u'llah brings justice. So what's going on? How can Baha'u'llah say, I have given you laws to last a thousand years? Because within those laws, my friend, he gives the content for the next thousand years. Okay, you have content. You have context. Remember algebra? n plus n equals 2n. How many different circumstances does that describe? Infinite. Right? Baha'u'llah revealed the algebraic laws. He gave principles. Plus he gave some explicit laws. But mostly he gave a fabric that would be the basis for all future legislation. And he created new institutions that would provide those laws that were not within the Book of Laws, that were required for human progress. So I'd like to summarize the whole lecture series by a chart. Before Adam, perhaps we had messengers who were seen, who brought the image of God as the mother, because we were at the infant stage of our development. By infant stage, meaning that we had dependence on God, reliance on God. Our main social identity was the self, as an infant has. They basically are occupied with their survival. The mathematics begins in the embryo. The baby starts noticing it has toes. Now, it doesn't count its toes unless it's an extraordinary fetus. 
but it does recognize the individuality of its toes and its fingers and chooses some over others to put in its mouth. And in terms of science, at the infant stage, mankind was in total wonderment of nature and fear, so that when lightning came, it must have been from God. And they would hide under a rock or a tree, probably not a tree if it's lightning. <laughs> And then another stage of childhood, the childhood stage from Adam to Jesus, developing from the young child to the older child. And there the image of God became the father. You see the image is evolving. The stage of maturity was the child stage as we mentioned. The means of growth was brought by Adam in Genesis 2, moral choices. And that would develop to higher and higher levels so that by the time of Christ, it would develop at a very high level. The social identity moved from the self to the family on to the city-state each one of increasing complexity, each one offering a greater opportunity for expression of capacity. Mathematics moved from additions, which we now think began with Adam, and the most early civilizations knew how to do additions, to geometry of the Greeks by the time of Christ, the most advanced mathematics during this period. And then after Jesus came Mohammed, which I separate as a separate stage of maturity, the adolescent stage, where the image of Father or the God is seen as the friend, no longer the Father image of authority that can punish with the grievous afflictions. But now a closer companion, the friend. The means of growth went beyond morality to a new understanding of the free will, which is required for morality and that is submission of my will to the will of God. And the social identity moved to the most complex unit so far, the nation state. We talked about that. Requiring universal ethical systems. Requiring new institutions. Requiring an abolition of all forms of prejudice. And then we move on to a mathematics which now reflect that higher state of understanding, algebra, the expression of principle rather than detail. And then that moved to calculus, which is the highest stage of additions. You see, if you're mathematics and teaching mathematics, you know that calculus is just the, the highest form of additions called integration. The integral is a way of adding infinitesimals. See? <laughs> and then from Muhammad to Baha'u'llah, Bab and Baha'u'llah, which bring the latest stage, where now the image of God is the lover. In prior dispensation, it was man who went after God. Baha'u'llah says in this day, God seeks out his beloved man. It is God who comes after us and pleads with us to have a love affair, 
on the spiritual plane. My friends, I like to call this the age of the lover. You see, we haven't yet discovered what it means to be a lover. We're just playing with it a little bit. We don't know what the love of a marriage will be in the future. It will not be what it is today. We don't know what brotherhood means. We have inklings of it. The only real purpose of the Baha'i communities today is to begin to experiment and to begin to model what these things might look like. Not as the end all, but as a process of workshops to begin to implement these new teachings. That's what Baha'i community, that's why one would become a Baha'i not just to bask in your glory that you've recognized Baha'u'llah, but to roll up your sleeves and to begin to practice those teachings. The social identity has moved to world citizen. With it, all the complete diversity of humanity, all the cultures, the races, the ethnicities, the different viewpoints, not just of national groups, but of individuals. You see, those two triangles, one was greater unity, but what was greater unity expressed as infinite diversity? It is unity that allows us to be ourselves. Not unity based on looking alike, on thinking alike, but unity based on content that releases us from the chains and imprisonment of the old ways of thinking. If religion doesn't create freedom, it is not from God. But it creates th freedom through submission. See, in the boardrooms of Enron, that's a hard concept. And in mathematics, I asked my Baha'i friend, who is a professor of mathematics at OSU, how many different mathematics have been discovered since Baha'u'llah? He says he doesn't know. He doesn't think there's any professor in the department who can tell you. Because each day, new mathematics are being created in the journals. It's increasing beyond the ability to keep up with it. My friends, it's a great day you live in. Congratulations. Thank you so much.